Chicago, where she was a TV news reporter and later the producer for a daily talk, uh, a daily talk show in Minnesota. And eventually, she made her way back to uh, made her way here to Utah, to Salt Lake City, where she spent five years producing a show that you may be familiar with, Good Things Utah, a daily talk show on KTVX. I heard some <gasps> gasps, gasps. Jill, while in the midst of dealing with some intense personal issues, was advised that in order to get past them, she needed to find her passion and pursue it. And after some self-examination, she launched the most successful blogging site called One Good Thing by Jilly. And the site covers a gamut of subjects such as home decor, craft, cooking, home cleaning supplies, do-it-yourself items of all kinds, and another one that she categorizes as bright ideas. And I checked in on her blog, and now I've checked in on it several times since then, <laughs> and it'll, it'll kind of hook you. Some, they are really are bright ideas, really cool things. And she's called home, or Utah, called Utah home for 17 years now, and we welcome her to Central Utah to Snow College. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Alan. Thank you all for being here. Wow, almost uh, a full house. This is exciting. I've never been to Snow College before, never been to Ephraim before, and it's a beautiful place, a beautiful campus, and it was a beautiful drive here. I couldn't have asked for a nicer day, so I'm, I'm thrilled to be here with you. Thank you for the nice introduction. Um, he gave you a little bit of background about my website and the things that I do right now, and I will fill in a little bit more as we go through um, my remarks today. But first of all, I just want to say I am flattered and humbled by this invitation to come here today. Um, I have a framed print in my office that says, I'm a big deal on my blog. <laughs> and it's kind of a, my son and daughter-in-law gave it to me for Christmas. It's kind of a sarcastic way of saying, you're not, you know, as big as you think you are and kind of keeping me, keeping me humble. Um, so I guess I think to myself when I'm asked to do something like this, you know, what, what do these people want to hear from a blogger? Well, I asked myself that question and I gave it some thought and I'm going to share with you what I think uh, might be helpful to you about what a blogger has to say. How many of you plan on working for a company or starting your own company someday? Good measure of you. Um, you cannot find any company nowadays that, doesn't, that does not have a website and a blog attached to that website uh, nowadays. Blogs have become huge in every aspect of, of business. Um, and somehow, if you are going to be working for this company or have your own company, you will probably be involved in some way contributing to whatever content is found on that blog. So. Number one reason, um, trivia question, where does the word blog come from? How, how did blog originate? It's a weird word, blog, blog. Anyone? Really? I thought everybody would know this. Anyone? Very good. Web blog. Has anyone ever heard of that? It started out as web blog, and it was kind of like an online journal. People started doing their journals online. It was on the web. It was kind of like a log of your life or a conversation. It got shortened to blog. So now you know. Now you know where blog came from. Anyway, blogs are here to stay. I'm pretty sure of it by now. Um, how many of you plan on, um, how many of you are married with kids or plan on getting married and having kids someday? Still not enough hands. I'm thinking there should be more. <laughs> um, this blogging is a great way for um, one of you in that partnership called a marriage and a family to be able to stay home and make a living. And I'm not just talking about the girls. I'm talking about the guys, too. My husband is a videographer for the LDS Church, and he follows a lot of blogs online from his, um, that are put on by his peers that are gentlemen or males. So it's not just a mommy blogger thing. There are blogs um, all, across, all across the board. So it can be very lucrative. It can be a good way to make a living. 
So I'm going to give you a little bit of a personal experience about this, my experience, so by giving you a little bit of background. I started OGT, I like to stay for short because it's a long, one good thing by Julie. My nephew and business partner tried to talk me into shortening it when we first got together. I'm like, no, <laughs> it's one good thing by Julie. And yesterday, he actually heard someone on the radio talking about this appearance and talking about one good thing by Julie. And they said, I love the name one good thing by Julie. And so he, he said, he actually said to me yesterday, I'm so glad you didn't listen to me when I told you to shorten the name. So go with what you feel, go with your gut. I started it July of 2011, so it's just over two years old, and um, I started with zero visitors, zero ads, <laughs> and zero expectations, really. Um, I'm going to get to, I forgot my clicker. And now, here are some of the statistics for my blog. Uh, OGT now gets an average number of visits a day of 111,000, average. Uh, average number of unique visitors a day. Does anyone know what the difference is between visitors and unique visitors? Unique visitors is that's all different people. Visitors could be the same person going once or twice uh, during the same day. So unique visitors is six, around 64,000. That's an average. It goes up and it goes down from there. And the average page views per month. Um, around now, it's been up as high as about 7 million plus, and it's around 5 million plus right now. I have about 74,000 Facebook followers, 7.2 thousand Twitter followers, 240,000 Pinterest followers, and 2.7K um, Instagram followers. My, my nephew and business partner has like hundreds of thousands of followers. I don't know if you've ever heard of a, a a website or an app called gig.com, but that's his baby, and he has hundreds of thousands of Instagram followers, so he says I'm an Instagram slacker, but I'm trying. I'm working on it. It's not really my, my audience, so anyway, and then um, in 2012, my company, One Good Thing by Jilly, grossed uh, over $250,000, and this year, year to date, we are at $383,000. Pretty good for a blog that was started on an ancient Dell laptop in the middle of the night in my old green leather chair. That was the inauspicious beginning of One Good Thing by Jilly. A little more background. Alan mentioned at the beginning that um, my blog was kind of born out of some difficulty in my life. Um, I love this quote by C.S. Lewis. There are going to be hardships in life, and um, even though I feel like I had a, real, a very privileged upbringing and a very wonderful beginning of my married life and having children, um, we all know that into every life some rain must fall, and sometimes that rain turns into a typhoon. And in my case, um, a little over six years ago, I entered a residential treatment center for substance abuse. Um, I was 44 years old, I was married, I had four children, and my life was completely out of control. <sighs> um, that's a long story, <laughs> and I won't go into that part of it today, because um, that could be a whole other hour or two. Um, but suffice it to say, it was a dramatic departure from my life as it had been up to that point and how I saw it turning out. Just no clue in the world that anything like this could happen to me, but it did. Um, as you can imagine, it was a very, very dark time for me and my family. And after 78 days in this residential treatment center, I, um, one of the most important things that I learned from my counselors was that um, I needed to find my passion in life, and that's what Alan alluded to earlier. And not only, they didn't give this like by way of suggestion, they pretty much said it was mandatory if I didn't want to end up right back in the same place again. I took that very seriously. I took it to heart. And so when I re-entered my real life, um, I, I, I had taken that seriously, and, I, and I, I was on the lookout for it. You know, I didn't know what that was going to be. I had no idea what that passion was going to be. Um, about six months later, I started the blog. Um, 
I didn't really realize it at the time that that was the passion that I was looking for, but it definitely turned out to be, and um, very grateful for it. The reason I kind of started it was that my background was in television news, and I had produced the talk show Good Things Utah for five years. I quit that job to take a full-time job closer to home, because I live in Heber, and Good Things Utah was in Salt Lake. It was a hour commute in the snow <laughs> in the winter, and my heart couldn't take that anymore. So I took something closer to home, but it wasn't nearly the creative challenge and the creative outlet that I'd had before. So I was posting things on my Facebook, all these creative, bright ideas that I would find, and I think my Facebook followers or, or friends were like, oh, not again. <laughs> so I decided I'll, I'll make a blog, and I'll, I'll put it on there. And that's about as much thought as went into it. I, it was for me to have a creative outlet. <clears throat> and the blog definitely helped me fulfill that need. So by starting the blog, I actually was finally doing what I love to do and loving what I did. That saying may seem a little trite, you know, even a little frivolous, but as I get older, I realize how important it is to love what you do um, because you're going to be doing it for a long time. <laughs> and if you want to be successful at it, you're going to have a lot more success if people know and can sense that you love what you do. It's going to make what you do that much better. Um, it's going to improve your product um, because people will sense that you love what you do. Um, just by example, um, and I think personally this has really contributed to the success of my blog because I do love what I do. Recently, back in April, um, we were approached by a literary agent to write a book for um, about the success of the blog and also my journey with addiction and recovery. And so we put together an outline and my agent shopped it around to several publishers and we went back to New York City. We met with, with the phone and personal interviews about 16 different publishers. Everybody wanted the book, which is very, very flattering and still is very surreal to me. At one point, you know, it finally came down to three and you know, kind of a bidding war, you know, that sounds way more dramatic than it was, but it was very flattering. They wanted, they wanted to publish my book and what many of them said, I think almost all of them said this, was that they had read my blog and they loved my voice. And I'm like, what does that mean? They can't hear me, you know, it's just my writing that they're reading on the, on the, on the computer screen, but I think for me, that translates in. They can feel that I love what I do, that I love what I'm talking about. So I contribute that again to loving what I do is really um, has contributed to the success of what I do. And I would pass that on to you as, as a really important piece of advice that I could give you today. So as you saw on the first, first slide, things really took off. Um, after the first year, the numbers were almost to where they are today. I mean, it was shot up. It was just dramatic. They're, they're a little bit higher now, and they kind of you know, go up and down, but it was that first year they just shot up dramatically. Um, something had clicked with people, and I began to see kind of trends, you know, um, the DIY, very popular, the um, eco-friendly, you know, living more green, making more green choices, being more uh, better stewards of our resources, that really clicked with people. Making your own products that were free of chemicals really clicked with people and saved money. These things, and, and I, I noticed this, and then I started to capitalize on that. You know, I, I noticed the things that, that people were responding to, whether it was a pin on Pinterest or sharing on Facebook or tweeting on Twitter. Um, and then I would, I would build upon that, and, and that too, I think, um, contributed to the success. But it wasn't just, you know, boom, skyrocket, easy, easy street. I worked hard. Um, and I really truly believe in this saying, the harder you work, the luckier you get. There really isn't um, a whole lot of luck, I don't think, involved in, in success. There might be, you know, an element to that. But it's really how hard you work. And like I said, if you love what you're doing, I worked hard. <laughs> I stayed up many, many, many very, very late nights really kind of early mornings, especially when I was still working a full-time job to get my posts out for the next day. Um, I ended up um, quitting that job nine months later after 
the income that I was earning from ads on the blog replaced the income that I was making at my full-time job. And then I took on my nephew as a business partner, Scott Warner, and things uh, continued to grow and improve from that. I decided from the beginning that I would post seven days a week. And when I tell that to other bloggers or other bloggers hear that, they're just like, what? Are you crazy? And now, yes, absolutely, I'm crazy because it's hard to do it seven days a week. But I wanted people to be able to count on one good thing a day from Julie, you know, something they could count on coming in their, in their um, email box, inbox, and that they, they um, looked forward to. And so that's what I started, and that's what I've committed to, and that's what I've done every single day since. And I think I'm on 850 posts now. So that's a lot of posts in just over a little too just over two years. But I still, I, and like I said, it kind of gravitated into more DIY, eco-friendly, homemade solutions, um, food. My, my son happens to have celiac disease, so I do a lot of gluten-free food, and that's kind of a big thing too now. And, um, but I also give myself the freedom to do anything I want to do, <laughs> talk about anything I want to do. And that's, that was um, on purpose. That's why it was one good thing by Jilly, because one good thing really could encompass, encompass just about anything. So I, I do try to keep it in those things because I know that that's what people will respond to, but I also have the flexibility to do it how I like it. So kind of the meat of what I wanted to talk about with you today is what my measures of success are today. I realize that this is a very personal thing. Everybody's measures of success are going to be different. Um, but I figured if I shared what mine were, it might be s kind of a jumping off point for you to think about what yours might be. Now that the website has achieved a certain amount of success, and I use air quotes on purpose because success, empirical measures of success would be money and um, um, statistics like I talked about and endorsements and sponsors and, and the book deal, you know, those are pretty empirical um, measures of success, but my thoughts turn to what, what is success really? What is it for me? And like I said, everyone's, is going, everyone's, everyone's measuring cups are going to look different from mine, but after some contemplation on my part, these are my true measures of success that I thought I would just share with you. Um, the first one is creative outlet. Talked about a little bit about that already. Um, this was important to me when I was, even when I was deciding what to major in, uh, at co in college. I chose broadcast journalism because that's super creative. Obviously, I didn't consider time or money when I <laughs> went into broadcast journalism because, A, there's not a lot of money in it unless you are, you know, the, the top 2% of the broadcast world and on the anchor des desk every night at, from, at 6 and 10. Otherwise, you don't make that much money in broadcast journalism. I'm sorry to tell you if that's any of your majors. Um, time, it's crazy time commitment, you know, you're just, you work overtime, you're all over the place. So it's, I, I obviously wasn't thinking about those two things, but creativity was, and to me still is, vitally important. Like, I would shrivel up and die <laughs> if I couldn't have a creative outlet. And it's actually my belief that you all probably feel the same way in a certain way. And maybe it's not, maybe you don't describe it as creative. Maybe you just think of it as challenging or something that motivates you, something that um, gets you out of bed in the morning um, and keeps you um, focused and engaged and motivated on what you want to do. So I think we all need what I call a creative outlet or a challenging outlet for ourselves. The, third, the second one is um, time management flexibility. Um, the nine to five punch the time clock desk job is not for me. I knew this early on. That's why I chose, that's probably the main reason I chose broadcast journalism, besides the creative thing. I did not want to have to sit at a desk from 9 to 5. Um, I remember working for my dad during the summers as a receptionist in his electrical contracting business, um, watching the clock just go slowly, and just thinking it would never get to 5 o'clock. I was convinced it was going backwards at points, because it, it was just agony for me to sit and watch a clock at a desk from 9 to 5. So that's important to me. Um, there were jobs over the years. Some were better than others. Like my talk show producing days were pretty good. That was always something different. And I wasn't always at my desk, although I spent some time at my desk. Um, so some were better than others. I had a desk job the last five years before I quit 
to do the blog full time, that was another. It was just like killing me inside. It was closer to home. That's why I chose to do it. My son is um, the one who has celiacs. Also, is has type one diabetes. So I felt more comfortable being closer to him. And so you know, I made I made a um, sacrifice in quitting the good things you talk. Because I love that job to be closer to home, but it was killing me <laughs> inside because it wasn't the creative outlet that I had had before, and it didn't it it didn't meet my true measures of success. Um, so being the keeper of my own time clock is a huge measure of success for me. And then finally, financial freedom. I think this is pretty, I think we can all probably agree on this one. Um, although it's to varying degrees what you think is financial success. I think everybody's bar is different. I mentioned before that I had a very privileged upbringing. Um, I am the daughter of amazing parents who happen to be here with me today. Carol and Richard Warner. Would you stand up for just one second? <laughs> I'm so, so proud to come from them. Um, <laughs> they, are both, they were raised in Kenosha and Fillmore, respectively. They moved to Southern California after they got married. And my father is a self-made entrepreneur. He started an electrical contracting business in Southern California that eventually ended up um, doing the work on the Tom Bradley LAX airport terminal. So very, very successful entrepreneur. So I had a very good model in, in that. And I had a mother who always, when you talk about your mother, you just can't help but cry, huh? Who modeled and encouraged education. Um, she was a huge proponent of education and always told me that I could do whatever I wanted to do as long as I put my mind to it. So I had wonderful, wonderful examples growing up. When I got married and got kicked out of the feathered nest, <laughs> it was a rude awakening <laughs> financially, as you can imagine. Um, I was on my own and had to um, deal with that, but it was a great thing in hindsight. <laughs> it was a good experience for me because it, it made me appreciate that financial part of the success puzzle that I would not have been able to appreciate before. And going back to the slide that we saw about hardships, um, you know, shaping your destiny and, and making you, making the ordinary extraordinary, I, total, I completely agree with that. And it was the motivation I needed. Um, it was very motivating for me. And I think every entrepreneur needs that kind of motivation to get out there to work and, and to be successful. Um, but of course, having enough, enough money is a really personal issue. Um, how much is enough? Um, it, it, it's going gonna, it's gonna to depend on who you are. And so I, I got to thinking about it. Um, how much is enough? And I, I got to thinking about in our early years when we were first married and we had little babies, that I used to fantasize about being able to go to the grocery store and buy whatever I needed. I mean, I'm not talking about like everything in the store or everything that I, my heart desired, just everything that I needed for a week or whatever, and not having to worry about what the total was when I went to the checkout stand. Have any, any of you ever been there? Because <laughs> you're, you're going down the, the aisles with a shopping cart and you're kind of either keeping a mental tally or a calculator tally, you know, because you only have so much money to cover what you're getting. That was my fantasy, which is kind of sad when you think about it, was to be able to check out at the grocery store and not have to worry about um, what the total was going to be. And now that that fantasy has come true, and actually um, I've been at that place for a while, it's easy, to take, it's easy to take it for granted. So I try to remind myself of that young mother and how she felt going to the grocery store and wishing she could just buy what she needed and not have to worry. And it's, it's humbling, and it makes me appreciate what I have um, even more. So that's kind of a, a litmus test for me when I start getting, you know, these grand ideas that I can go to Walmart and just buy whatever I want. <laughs> um, I think of that young mother who couldn't do that. So in a nutshell, those are my measures of success. Um, I hope some of them will, like I said, ins inspire you to think about what your measures of success are to just kind of have a goal in mind of um, what it is that you want to do, especially for the students. And, um, and I wanted to end with one last piece of advice. 
that I think is particularly applicable to this, most of the people in this audience um, who are um, college students who are just getting ready to go out and conquer the world. I think this is hugely important. I'm, I'm terrible at this. This is one of my faults, is comparing myself to others. Um, none of this stuff comes overnight. You, you cannot expect yourself to be an expert at the very beginning. The expert in anything was once a beginner. Allow yourself to be a beginner. Everybody has to start somewhere. And without starting somewhere and taking that journey, making those mistakes along the way, you're not going to learn the things that you need to learn to be successful. Everybody, um, everybody has to, to learn. Um, it, it, it's a process. My blog might be considered like an overnight success, I guess. You could kind of say that because in a year, it really did just like skyrocket. But you have to think about that um, there were years of dues <laughs> that were behind that success. Um, one of my strongest beliefs um, is that content is king. Um, that's a whole other lecture. But, and I really concentrate on content. And I think that is an, um, comes from my, my days as, of producing and, and television reporting. Um, I knew how to create good content. So I had, you know, there was, there was dues that came before um, I even started the blog. Um, so I had, I had some experience. I wasn't starting out as just a beginner. But you can't expect yourself to be an expert when you first start out. So allow yourself to be a beginner. Um, realize you're going to make mistakes. Everyone makes mistakes. Everyone makes mistakes in life and in business. I am the perfect example of both. I have made my fa fair share of big and little mistakes. Everyone's going to make mistakes. That's how you learn. And that's how you grow. And um, it's a necessary part of your journey. So, and just remember, I keep going back to the hardships. The hardships are what are going to take us from ordinary to extraordinary. And I, I, I look around this room, and I just see nothing but potential. And I know that e each of you has your own, your own dream and your own you know, possibilities. And I just know that there are so many, all of you out there have your own extraordinary journey and story ahead of you and I am excited for you and I, I'm excited to find out how those all pan out so I hope you'll all remember what my um, Twitter handle was or my email and let me know you know about those successes I would love to hear what your plans are what your journey is and and how it turns out and so I just want to thank you for this opportunity and um, hope that I helped um, inspire you a little bit and then I want to open it up for questions, if anyone has any questions. How did, how did I grow my blog from zero visitors and zero? <laughs> well, I started with my mom and dad, for one thing. They were my first two followers. <laughs> and then um, just, uh, you know, it just starts slowly at first. But there are some things you can do. Um, one of my secret weapons, um, and this does not just apply to girls, but a lot of people think it does, is Pinterest. If you are interested in starting a blog, Pinterest is a huge blog traffic driver. And so when my blog started, Pinterest had just kind of started too. So I kind of rode that wave. And I saw it coming, or I saw the, the effect that things were having when they were pinned on Pinterest. And I was, saw the things that did well on Pinterest, and so I built upon that. So you just kind of pay attention to what blog posts you're doing that really have, you know, a big impact, and then you want to do more of those. Um, so Pinterest is huge, and then social media in general is just huge. 50% um, of my traffic comes from social media. 95% of that is Pinterest. I was not looking to monetize from day one. I had no idea blogs could make money. And I get that question all the time. You can make money with a blog? I'm like, yes. <laughs> I told you what, you know, we made last year, this year. But honestly, when I started, I had no idea. I had to, it was a few months into it, and I'm like, hmm, I wonder if I could somehow make money doing this. And so I looked into 
I saw ads, you know, Google ads were on some blogs that I'd been on, and so I looked into that, but I was totally had to educate myself as to how that worked. So I started out with Google ads, which most blogs can, and then I moved on to ad networks, which you have to be accepted into, and you have to have a certain level of traffic work before they'll take you on. So no, when I started, I had no idea you could make money <laughs> doing a blog. Um, for Google Ads, I'm not sure. Oh, I'm sorry. She asked how you um, get the ads on your site, right? That basically. I started out with Google Ads, and back then, and I, I'm not even quite sure how it is now. Anybody and their brother could put a Google Ad because it's based on clicks. So if if people don't click on the ad, you don't make any money. Nowadays, I'm with several ad networks, and I get paid. Um, on how many people visit the site based on because I have a certain established amount of people that visit the site so based on that is how much I get paid but anybody I think can start with Google I think there is a, sh a small application process you know that you would have to go through to get Google Ads and then they give you a short piece of code you put it on your blog and the, the ads start appearing and that makes money yeah and it's based on people clicking on their ads and then the more traffic that you get, you'll start to make more money. And I want to tell you one little secret. People, when I first started out, people would say, there was an ad on your blog for women's lingerie or something like that, you know, something silly. I'm like, really? That, I'm so embarrassed. I'm so sorry. But I found out that what people see on Google Ads is based on what they're searching for on their computers. <laughs> so don't blame me. <laughs> that that's coming up on your computer. <laughs> Just keep that in mind when people try and blame ads on you. Did I see another hand over here somewhere? That is a lot of blogging. <laughs> How do I keep it fresh? How do I blog every day? Um, I get the question a lot do you ever run out of ideas? And I'm like, that is the least of my worries. I have so many ideas that I want to do. It's just a matter of having the time to execute them all because, you know, I want to write about it in my own words. I want to take my own pictures. I want to try it, you know, myself. But there's not a lot of, there's not enough time to do that every single post. So some of the posts I do are what I call curated posts. And I'll, today's post is a pretty good example of it. It's 21 days to stop. 21 days, 21 ways to stop wasting money. That's just kind of a compilation of ideas that I found in my research. So that's something I do besides the ones that are full-blown, take my own pictures, you know, do my own um, craft or recipe. Those take a lot of time. So that's kind of how I get away with the seven days a week. I did finally give myself one day off a week. I call it Save My Sanity Saturday, where I do an oldie but a goodie. I repost something because it, it's hard <laughs> to keep it up seven days a week. There is um, a couple of, oh, how do you start a blog? Um, there are a couple different platforms. There's something called Blogger, B-L-O-G-G-E-R. Very easy, user-friendly platform to start a blog. They have templates, they have designs very easy to figure out. Um, that's how I started, on Blogger. And it's owned by Google, I believe. And then when the website got, got bigger, we moved to WordPress. Some people start out on WordPress. It's a little bit harder to learn initially, but um, that's another option to start out on. They, they, they provide you with the templates, with everything you just have to start doing. And if I could just build upon that, it's just people say, how do you, you, know, how do you get started? I'm like, just start posting stuff. Just start putting it out there. Even if it's just your mom and dad that are following you and reading it, eventually you're going to have more readers, and then they're going to want more content to go back and look at, and you're going to have it there for them. Whereas if you, you know, just have that one post and you're just waiting for people to come and read it, you know, that's not going to happen. You just you need to keep pumping out the content. The expense was my... Oh, is there any expense to having a blog? The expense was my ancient Dell laptop, which I already had, and um, the electricity to run it. <laughs> there was re there's really no expense. At this point, I do have expenses. I have, I have an IT person because 
you know, I kind of reached the limits of my knowledge of how to do things on the web and computer-related issues. As a matter of fact, this last week we've been having issues with hackers, and it's been a nightmare. And I would have been lost without my IT person to do it. And I do have someone now who helps me with social media and answering all of the emails and things like that. But to begin with, I can't think of one cost except you need a computer and, a, and an internet connection, which you probably get here at school. <laughs> Um, some, not a whole lot. Uh, uh, um, he asked about um, revenue from other sources than ads. The, by far, the majority of our revenue is from ads, but we also do what we call sponsored posts um, on occasion. We try to limit them to not, you know, I don't, I don't want to do a sponsored post, obviously, every other day because my readers would get turned off by that. But Blog readers, and I think you'd probably, you know, on blogs that you've been on, have probably seen sponsored posts before. It's another way for us to earn revenue, and I think readers understand that because bloggers have to make money. You know, they're not just, well, I don't know, some of them might be in it just for kicks, but if you're doing it full time like I am, I, I need to earn a living. So sponsored posts are another way that you can earn money, and, and for us, it's been people that have approached us, like emailed us and said, you know, what you do on your blog is really similar to our product, and would you be interested in doing a sponsored post? And I would add to that that I really do take pride in trying to make a post, even though it's sponsored, to at least still have useful creative content attached to it. Because I, I just don't want them to, my readers to come and have it be an, a full-blown ad. That actually works. Oh, I know that nasty yellow waxy stuff. Oh, it's so awful. Yeah, I, um, he, he asked about, you know, what's kind of the process from start to finish of doing a blog post. And if I were to take, let's say, like a DIY blog post, I would have to say um, people always wonder, you know, where do you come up with your great ideas? I'm like, you know what, honestly, I don't, like, create all of them in my mind. I usually... I'm inspired by something else that I see, but I always try to give it my own spin, and I'll always try it out first myself. You know, I'm not going to take someone else's word for it that homemade flypaper is going to work, because I'm like, that sounds ridiculous. I don't think that's going to work. But it did. It was crazy. It was sticky, and it looked much better than the icky yellow waxy stuff. But so I, I come up with an idea, whether it's completely out of my head or just something inspired by Pinterest or something I've seen somewhere else. A lot of what I do comes from readers' comments. They will ask a question like, how do I do this or how do I do this or have you ever thought of doing that? Some of my best posts have come from that. And then I just try it out. And honestly, there have been a fair number I've tried out and they've never made it to the blog because that was a failure. Although some of my most spectacular failures I do put on the blog just because they're funny. <laughs> <laughs> I and mean, some of them have been really real doozies. So, but if they just pretty much fall flat, I'm just like, that was a waste, and just chalk it up to experience and don't put it on. And then I, I have by default have to become a photographer, and I had no desire to become a photographer. But um, and I use the word photographer loosely because I am not a good photographer. But you have to be able to take some photos for your blog because that it's a very visual um, medium, and so you want to be able to especially for Pinterest and repinning and things like that, you need to have at least some decent images to use. And then writing. Um, I think, like I said about your voice, I think it's really important to use your voice in your blogs and to use personal experiences. Um, going, harkening back to my journalism days at BYU, we talked about the Wall Street Journal lead. Has anyone ever heard of that? where you start out with a story, you know, and you get, engage them with the story of a real person in their, in their lives, and people love that. They love when they hear your stories, and then in the comments, they're hearing their stories. People love to put in their two cents on anything that you blog about. And I think those are the main elements, is just um, a good idea, good photographs, and then um, good writing, or at least engaging writing.
not early on. Uh, he asked about SEO. Does everyone know what SEO is? Search engine optimization. Very important in, the, in websites in the blogging world because you want your blog or your website to be optimized so that people, when they go on Google and are searching for how to make homemade laundry detergent, hopefully my website will come up at least in the top five. Um, it should now because I had a lot of hits on that post. But not in the beginning. I didn't know what SEO was. I really didn't. Um, I, I've educated myself over the years, over the two years, and I have someone who helps me with that part-time. Um, my, my main suggestion would be naming your images. Surprisingly, people will just keep the images that they use on their websites image 3288, you know, dash 22. And that is not helpful for someone who is searching perhaps through images on Google looking for something. By naming your images what it is, like say homemade laundry detergent, name the image homemade laundry detergent. And then when you post it on your blog, if you know anything about the platforms, it'll allow you to put an alternate text, put a very descriptive text in there also. Very, very important for SEO. Any other questions? That's a good question. Um, I wish I had more time. Oh, she asked. <laughs> I thought I'd be better at this. I forget. Um, she asked if I follow any blogs and what kind of blogs I follow. Honestly, when I started a blog, I didn't follow any blogs. I didn't even, you know, I didn't give blogs a second thought. Since I've become a blogger, obviously I um, am more in tune in, in the blogging world. And having gone to many different blogging conferences, I'm introduced to new bloggers that I didn't know before. Some of them, I'd say probably the majority are probably within the realm that I do. But I also follow, I follow bloggers, especially like gluten-free food bloggers because my son is, is celiacs. Um, I'll follow them. I'll follow some photography blogs that are purely photography because I want tips on how to become a better photographer and and things like that. Just things that interest me. Um, but then you also want to kind of keep your eye on the competition, so you follow your your peers in the blogging world. But that brings up another point that I try to make at, at most of my presentations is that co um, collaboration gets you a lot farther in this world than competition. It's so often that bloggers and any you know any business in general try to be competitive with each other and there's always going to be that to a certain extent but I found that um, collaborating with other bloggers who I perceive as kind of like my competition has been way more beneficial to both of us you know we, we both it's a win-win we, we both gain new new followers and and people that are exposed to our our blog and our our content that wouldn't have been before so that's that's my my thing is it's collaboration over competition. You better email me your blog because I will be your third follower. As a matter of fact, I will tweet you and I will Pinterest you and I will guarantee. Email me jill at byjilly.com or tweet me at Jill's Good Things and I'll give you some social media love. Jill at byjilly.com. And the, uh, go back to the first slide. And at Jill's Good Things is both Instagram and Twitter. And maybe just a good place to end would be talking a little bit about social media. It's huge. It's so important. Um, I talked a little bit about Pinterest, but they all are kind of this, you know, part and parcel of the same thing. Social media is so important and you really have to keep up on it. It's not something you can just do, you know, once in a while. You really, it's really a way to get new followers, to, um, what, something we didn't touch on that, I don't know, I wouldn't say it's huge, but it's helpful or giveaways on, on Instagram or Pinterest or Facebook, you know, making them specific to say, I really want to boost up my Instagram following, which I really need to, although it's come a long way. <laughs> um, I'll have an, uh, a giveaway that I announce on my blog, but in order to enter, they have to follow me on Instagram. So it's basically bribing people to follow you. But it works.
And so, yeah, I can't emphasize enough how important social media is, and I'm sure you guys all are all over your social media and know how that works. So. But for those of you who aren't, I would encourage you to make it a priority because it's very, very, very important. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate you all being here. Thank you so much for being here and doing that for us. There's something inspiring about seeing somebody who is where you are now, who was where you are now, and then seeing them in a few years after some hard work and dedication being very, um, very successful by whatever measures you use. <laughs> uh, I've read her... Uh, story on her blog and as inspiring as it is to see somebody who is in the same place you seem to be which we've had some of those we've had some that were just in college a couple years ago who have come and presented Jill has come from a place that might have been a lot farther down the canyon than where you are right now to where she is which is even more inspiring in a way so I would encourage you to visit her site read her story and think about what you have the potential to do in your life Thank you again, Jill.